welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. All right, welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm user Steelcan909 here with um, our guest today. I'm going to go ahead and let him introduce himself, what he's going to be talking about, and then we'll kind of just dive on right in. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm James Curry. I'm a PhD student at Royal Holloway in the UK, specializing in the Crusades. And I'm here today to talk about uh, two particular books that grabbed my attention. One called God's Battalions, The Case for the Crusades by Rodney Stark, and the other called Glory of the Crusades by Steve Weidenkopf. Uh, they're both terrible. Don't buy them. Don't read them. They are appalling. However, the way in which they are terrible is what captured my interest, because they are terrible in almost exactly the same way, and they are serving a very particular demographic, and I find the relationship between um, the people that these books are for, who are predominantly traditionalist Catholics, that that meaning Catholics who uh, typically reject the ecumenical council called Vatican II, and generally don't like ide the idea of modernizing the church, and the relationship between those people and modern crusade historiography is bizarre because these books will tell the reader that modern historiography is too Protestant, too secular, uh, poisoned by Enlightenment philosophy. And then you open the bibliography and they're using all these modern histories. So that contradiction is where my interest comes from. Um, and I'd like to talk about what makes these books terrible, but also not just what makes them bad history, but what makes them intellectually dishonest in a way that is, from my perspective as someone who does keep up with modern crusade historiography, um, it's just bizarre in a very, to me, interesting way. All right, well, so let's, um, let's kind of just dive into the meat of it then. Like, so who are these people? What are they writing? Why is it bad? Okay, so the two authors uh, I'm looking at here are very different, although they've arrived at the same conclusion. On the one hand, you have uh, Steve Weidenkopf, who is a radical traditionalist Catholic. Traditional Traditionalist Catholics come in many uh, shapes and sizes, but on the mild end, you have ones who are just nostalgic for when the liturgy was still done in, in Latin. And on the more extreme end, you have people who still regard Protestants as Catholics and as people who want to I guess, make Catholicism great again. People who look back at the, at the Middle Ages in particular and see the glory days of the papacy and want that to be the church. Steve Feigenkopf is very much from that background. He is writing for that background. And his book, The Glory of the Crusades, uh, is very much uh, being upfront about what it's for. It's for glorifying the crusaders. And then on the other hand, you have Rodney Stark's God's Battalions, The Case for the Crusades. Rodney Stark is, in some respects, a very respected scholar. He's not really a historian. He's a sociologist of religion, I think. Um, and he's particularly praised for his work on early Christianity. He was the first person to put forward a coherent theory for why Christianity took over the Roman Empire. However, in the last sort of 10 years of his life, he became more and more associated with conservative Christian movements in the US and expressed public sympathy for traditionalist Catholic viewpoints, particularly on things like the teaching of evolution in schools. And as a result of that, the quality of his work slightly goes down the slope. And reading God's Battalions, I think it's, I haven't read all of his books, I've read some of them, but it's the worst of his books that I've read and the worst book on the Crusades that I have read. And I've read many bad books. So now that we've got kind of a background on who these two individuals are, how are they similar in what they're doing with the uh, history of the Crusades? Is their work, I mean, what are the similarities between them? Are there any differences? Is this a case of just bad history? Is this ideological kind of, can you walk us through what makes these particular books bad and why? So what makes both these books bad is that they share a historiographical perspective that 
all modern crusade scholarship has been distorted by Protestantism, then by the Enlightenment, and then by secularism. They believe that there is a sort of anti-Catholic conspiracy amongst the modern historiography, even though, and we'll get onto this, but many modern crusade historians are Catholics, and they particularly want to defend the crusades against moral criticism. The idea that the crusades were bad is something they really chafe against. In that respect, they are very similar, they have the same conclusion, and I, having read them both, I think they are both written from the conclusion backwards. The research is driven in service of the conclusion rather than doing the research and coming to a conclusion from the evidence. What separates them is that Rodney Stark is not a straightforward traditionalist Catholic. He sympathises with them a lot, or he did before he passed away last year, but he's not from that world. So he he doesn't go as strongly on the anti-Protestant rhetoric. He is perhaps a little more balanced in how he deals with some of the historiography, although in some respects is worse. And he does not complain about Pope John Paul II specifically. Um, Weidenkopf really hates Pope John Paul II because on the 900th anniversary of the First Crusade, he apologised. And because he is from a traditionalist Catholic background, where the Crusades are defended as a morally good episode in the history of the Church, it's nothing to apologise for. So, from his perspective... He has a go at Pope John Paul II for kind of selling out the church, as it were, whereas Rodney Stark doesn't have that because he doesn't have the emotional attachment to the Catholic Church in the same way that Weidenkopf does. So in that respect, they're a bit different, but they they are so similar that when I was asked to look at uh, God's Battalions, I made a bullet point list of predictions based on Glory of the Crusades, and uh, I got eight out of ten, six of them within the first ten pages of God's Battalions. So, although there are differences, they are more or less the same book. Well, let's go ahead and go into those points that you raised. Like, what are the kind of the consistent uh, red flags that we can look for in Crusades literature, Crusades history, to let us know, hey, maybe we're not dealing with a particularly... Uh, well-sourced, well-researched, or um, modern understanding of the Crusades. Okay, so let's say you have been gifted a book on the Crusades and you want to know if it's really good or if it's an ideological axe-grinding exercise. Usually it becomes very apparent in the introduction because that's where the author kind of lays out their stall. And the first thing that these books tend to do is they will claim uh, that crusade historiography has been distorted. Uh, As I said before, by Protestants, by the Enlightenment, they tend to particularly round on David Hume. And then they will claim that modern historiography is too secularist. If it's really, really bad, I mean, really deep into the traditionalist, radical Catholic perspective, They will claim that only Catholics should write Catholic history because only they can understand. Um, Although, obviously, none of them are Knights Templar, so I don't quite know where they're coming from there. But that's usually point number one. Point number two that will become quite obvious is that they will portray the Crusades, and the First Crusade in particular, as a defensive war, as a counterattack. Against And the phrase that comes up a lot is centuries of Muslim aggression. You can replace aggression with colonization, if you like. That comes up a bit as well. But there's this claim that the, essentially that the Muslim world deserved it. That is not well supported by contemporary evidence. None of the versions of the Council of Clermont, where Urban II called the First Crusade, has that kind of narrative in it. None of the... Um, The two main contemporary accounts, participant accounts for the First Crusade, neither of them mention it. It's not really well grounded, but they will push it as if that is the narrative. I do have a 
so anything that portrays the Crusades as a defensive war, immediately dodgy. I do have a question about that, actually, because, I mean, if you've read a bit about the Crusades, you know that the original impetus for them, at least on for one of the impeti, imp, impeti, one of the impetuses of the Crusades was the Byzantine Empire calling for help against the uh, Turks who had, they had just lost the Battle of Manzikert to, and they were losing control of much of Asia Minor, what is today Turkey. So how do you square the Crusades are not a reaction to centuries of quote-unquote Muslim aggression and the fact that Alexios Komenos was saying, please come here, help us fight Muslims? Is it the target of the crusade? Is it the particular Muslims they're fighting? Is it the uh, is this just something that's because it's become a post facto justification that just kind of has taken on a life of its own? Kind of, can you walk us through how you walk through walk that line between those two? The the thing is, in 1095, the Byzantine Empire was kind of doing all right compared to a few years earlier when the Seljuk Turks were uh, being much more aggressive uh, when they were pushing even into the Aegean Sea. The difference between the, the crusade as a specific um, plea for Byzantine help and this broader idea of a clash of civilizations is that it's not a clash of civilizations. Um, the first crusade was... Okay, so the first crusade was not requested by the Byzantine Empire in the sense that they wanted a crusade. They wanted some guys with swords to show up. Um, they didn't want a holy war. But the first crusade, as a response to Byzantine requests for aid... Um, only works in the context of the Sultanate of Rum, specifically. It's not about, say, it's not about the wars fought between the early caliphs and the Emperor Heraclius back in the 7th century. It's not about that. Whereas the narrative of it was a defensive war tends to go for this broad idea. Um, the other big issue... Um, with the Crusades as a defensive war, even in the context of the Sultanate of Rome, is that a lot of the participants just didn't see it that way. You know, we can you can have this kind of big picture idea uh, as much as you like, but if the guys on the ground aren't believing it, then it doesn't really matter. Because a guy like Bohemond, a southern Italian Norman who led the First Crusade, didn't really care for well, frankly, he didn't seem to care much for holy war as a concept. He certainly didn't care about historic uh, rivalries between Christian and Muslim countries, despite living in one that had fought with Muslims quite often. He was in it because he wanted to establish a principality of his own, because he had lost out on the inheritance of southern Italy to his half-brother, and he successfully did that by creating the Principality of Antioch. So when we're talking about the Crusades as a kind of defensive war, or really any altruistic motivation, people like Bohemond come up and they need to be explained because a clash of civilization narrative does not explain the people who are there for their own power or their own glory. And even if they do have, shall we say, altruistic motives, um, it doesn't mean they buy into a broad intellectual narrative of clash of civilizations. They might just think it's a good thing and not really put much more thought into it than that. The link between a broad narrative of a clash of civilizations and what the people on the ground were actually doing, why they were fighting, doesn't seem to actually exist. And so when you look at these books, they can find some people from the time who say there is a clash of civilizations that has been going on for centuries, but they are all philosophers or theologians who have little to no contact with the average crusader. And so it's disingenuous to present that as the consensus view, but they will do that unflinchingly. So because these books are about defending the crusaders morally, Look up how they handle massacres, because these books tend to minimise the atrocities committed by crusaders, and they will do it in a manner that is intellectually dishonest, that will quote secondary literature out of context, that will attempt to make the violence of the crusade seem normal 
and that is fundamentally ahistoric. What is particularly frustrating, and I'm going to use the Massacre of Jerusalem in 1099 as an example, is that they will kind of take secondary literature and use the lowest possible estimates, and they will use uh, quotes out of context, and they will not give the reader any indication that they've done this. Um, Glory of the Crusades gives a death toll for the Massacre of Jerusalem of 3,000. Actually, it says the lowest might be 300, which is completely without evidence. But it then says, well, maybe higher estimate, 3,000. That is the lowest estimate of modern historians. The absolute lowest. And even then, that is only the people who were in the complex of temples um, at the heart of Jerusalem, not the people who were, say, in the streets near the walls where the massacre would have started. So there's a very disingenuous use of secondary literature. What God's Battalions does that really annoys me is that it, it quotes John France, who's a, a very distinguished historian of the Crusades um, and of military history of the Middle Ages in general. And John France, in his book Victory, of the e uh, Victory in the East, talks about the Massacre of Jerusalem and why it strikes us as so bloody. And he points out that it's not actually the quantity, and he compares it to the harrying of the North carried out by William the Conqueror, which in terms of quantity was far worse. But he says, he points out what's horrifying about the Crusades, the massacres of Crusades, is that the participants are having a great time. If you look at the contemporary sources, particularly for the massacre in 1099, there's a guy called Raymond, um, who was chaplain to Count Raymond, who led the Southern French contingent. His eyewitness account is delighted. He says, um, slightly frustratingly, uh, slightly frustratedly, that the Muslims who were beheaded got it easy. And so there's that glee. Whereas if you look at something like the Harrying of the North, everyone's appalled. They go, this is an atrocity, this, may, this is indefensible. And so the point John Francis is making there is that what makes the Massacre of Jerusalem horrifying isn't that it, a lot of people were killed. For a lot of people to be killed wasn't that uncommon. It's that the attitude of the sources is so different. You know, normally it's appalling, but here they th some of them think it didn't go far enough. And that's what's so striking about the Massacre of Jerusalem in 1099. But if you look at these books, God's Battalion just takes the bit where John France says it wasn't worse than many other massacres of the Middle Ages. And that's the only bit it quotes. And that has to be a deliberately misleading, intellectually dishonest reading of the secondary literature. Because if you literally turn the page, he describes it as repellent. Because what's particularly remarkable about the Massacre of Jerusalem is it, it happened over two days. And that means that the participants had a chance to literally sleep on their actions, wake up the next, get, wake up the next day and think, oh yeah, we should keep doing this. Whereas usually uh, commanders are able to rein in their troops uh, and stop them pillaging. So that's, that's the next big thing. Look at the massacres uh, and how they describe them or even if they describe them. God's Battalions does not mention the massacre um, of the garrison of Acre in 1191, when they surrendered to Richard the Lionheart. Um, he, after they surrendered to Richard the Lionheart, Richard made ransom demands to Saladin. Saladin, I think, deliberately dragged his heels to buy time to build up military strength, and Richard had them executed uh, very publicly. But... In the, in, by medieval ethical standards, one of the things you absolutely do not do is execute surrendered prisoners, because the whole point of a surrender is that you're guaranteeing their lives. And so that's kind of almost irredeemable in a way. The, the contemporary sources do find ways to defend it, mainly by blaming Saladin, because Saladin was dragging his heels. Um, he never really intended to pay the ransom, and he knew the consequences of that. But they will, they will try to kind of mitigate it by essentially regurgitating medieval propaganda. And in the case of God's Battalions, it just doesn't mention that massacre. So they might not, if, if they mention the massacres at all, they minimize them, 
but they might just not mention them at all. So if you're open, looking at reading a book on the Crusades and you get to the Massacre of Jerusalem in 1099 and they go, oh, it wasn't so bad, then that is a bad book because it's not engaging with important differences in the sources. And then the next point, which does happen in some proper crusade books, but only in the mid-2000s, is they talk a lot about George Bush's foreign policy. That might seem very weird for a crusade book to be talking about 21st century foreign policy, but George Bush and his war on terror is very popular among traditionalist Catholics, and it is criticized on moral grounds, and most importantly, George Bush described it as a crusade. And so traditionalist Catholics embrace it as a continuation of the Crusades. In legitimate histories of the Crusades, um, they engage with it, with that, as a, as a kind of interesting lesson in the frustratingly contemporary relevance of Crusade history. Whereas what these books will do is engage with it essentially as a jumping off point to complain about modern criticism of Europe going to the Middle East and killing people, and to kind of draw a line between them and say that modern neoconservative foreign policy is like the Crusades and they're both morally good. So if you see this kind of very politicized treatment of George Bush's foreign policy in a book on the Crusades, that indicates that it is being written with a modern political ideological motivation rather than in actual interest in the history. I think those are the main indicators that a book on the Crusades is dodgy. So you mentioned that you compiled a list of what was wrong with these books. You said it was based off of one of them and you applied it to the other one and it hit most of the marks, most of them within the first 10 pages. Um, so there were obviously the ones that you just mentioned. Uh, were there any additional ones in there that, you know, seemed to be coming up in this kind in in this kind of genre of book? Okay, so I'll, I'll go through the, the just the full list as I made it. So number one was claims that crusade history has been distorted by the evil Protestants and or Enlightenment philosophers. Tick, that's in there. Misrepresenting current scholarship. That's in there. Because if they're doing the first thing, they're doing the second thing. Um, a lot of them won't actually engage with modern... Even though you'll find it in the bibliographies, they won't actually talk about modern historiographical developments because these are traditional authors for whom historiography kind of had to stop around the time of Vatican II because that's when the distortion really um, kind of took hold for them. So they kind of... Their intellectual development stops then, and they don't acknowledge historiography after that, generally speaking. Um, although, as I said, it's in the bibliographies, and we'll get to that. Number three claims that Catholic history is the real history of the Crusades um, and of the Middle Ages, because only Catholics can write Catholic history. That was in glory of the Crusades, but not God's battalions. Number four was uh, complaints about John Paul II. Not in God's battalions is in glory of the Crusades. Uh, number five, characterizations of medieval Europe as morally, culturally, scientifically, and militarily superior to the Middle East. That's in both, but God's Battalions has a whole chapter. Most of it is factually wrong, um, or at the very least considers those things in a very Eurocentric way. Um, I'd say both of them do it, but God's Battalions does it a lot more. Number six comes back to uh, the bibliography. If you look at the bibliography of these books, they seem quite impressive. And then you look at the actual use of those texts uh, in the book, and they tend to be just mined for narrative or basic facts. They're not making any substantial points using the secondary literature. And if they are, it's always in a dishonest way, uh, taking things out of context, uh, as I said about uh, John France and the massacre in 1099. So they both do that. Number seven was... Uh, using contemporary sources at face value if they support the author's views, but being critical or not including them at all if they don't. Both texts do that a lot. Number eight was uh, the claim that uh, the Crusades were a response to uh, centuries of, of Muslim colonialization or similar sentiments. Both do that. Number nine, minimization or justification for massacres. They both do that. 
Number 10, uh, I wrote down as something, something, 9-11, George Bush, war and terror, etc. They both do that. So that's the full list. Quite a lot of overlap. So with this list of features that are common to these books, which of these have places in legitimate crusade historiography? Like, are there going to be any debates about some of these topics, like the defensive nature of the Crusades, the casualty estimates, the massacres, are these things that are actually relatively settled history amongst more properly trained and more um, up-to-date academics? And these authors are just completely ignoring that for an ideological bent. Like basically what I'm trying to ask is if we were going to be charitable to these authors, which we don't necessarily need to be, but if we were going to be, uh, is there anything worth delving into here, or is this purely an ideological, partisan hack job of history? So, the first thing I'd say is that some of these topics had a legitimacy. So, for instance, the massacre of Jerusalem and the extent of it was debated. The thing is, it was kind of settled a while ago. Um, lower estimate of about 3,000, as I said. And most historians just do accept that because the topic has been so debated in the past that a consensus has been reached. And it's the same kind of deal with the idea of the Crusades as a response to centuries of Muslim colonization. Um, It was kind of... You do occasionally see a bit of that in modern American historiography, You barely see it at all in European historiography. Um, I was at a recent conference where uh, an American historian tried to argue that narrative and uh, the room did not like them, to put it mildly. Um, And so there is a a bit of leeway there. Um, As I said, some sources do mention it as this kind of of big picture view of what had happened as a retrospective justification. But The overwhelming consensus, and I think it is overwhelming, is that that argument comes from ideology rather than an honest assessment of the evidence. Because if that was the reason behind it, Urban II might have mentioned it, and he he didn't. Um, Or at least he doesn't in any of the, the versions of the speech we have. So there's a little bit of leeway with some of these topics, but they are all issues that have been settled. Like, no one questions that the Enlightenment philosophers were really hostile to the Crusades. But no one's using David Hume as historiography today. No one. And so it's it's an entirely spurious point to make because it's irrelevant to modern Crusade history. And a lot of these things are. They might have been important at some point, but they're not anymore. You know, no one talks about the Crusades in the context of George Bush anymore. George Bush has not mattered for many years. But to these authors, it's still relevant because they are coming from the same ideological place. Okay. So now that we've kind of talked about what's wrong with these books, what's wrong with their approaches to the Crusades, can you tell us a little bit more about why are these books being published? Like, what, who is the audience for these? Why are they coming out Uh, Because clearly the audience here does not seem to be other academics. Um, And since they're not aimed at an academic academic audience, are they aimed at a popular audience? Are they aimed at a kind of a niche group for political purposes, for financial purposes? And are these guys just grifters who are looking to make a buck off of conservative Catholics and other conservatives in the United States? Because you've mentioned that this is kind of a distinctly American phenomenon. Um, And could you kind of tell us a little bit more about what's going on with the broader literary field that these books are in? Okay, so the first thing is, I don't think either of these authors are grifters. I think they genuinely believe what they're writing. And I think they are making what is for them genuinely earnest historical inquiries. I think that's particularly apparent in how they use the contemporary sources, because quite often when you you come across a a book on a a historical topic, especially pre-modern, 
that's obviously a bit of a hack job. They don't really know their stuff when it comes to the contemporary sources. Both of these books actually do. Um, impressively, they both engage with a wide range of contemporary evidence. The problem is because they don't really acknowledge modern historiography unless it's useful to them, unless it's useful to their narrative, rather. They don't take on board what the modern historiography has to say about how these sources need to be interpreted and the problems they have with being taken at face value. And so they will end up taking them at face value um, a lot of the time. You know, when, for example, there are, when the Crusaders um, on the First Crusade uh, attacked Jews in what's called the Rhineland Massacres in 1096, the contemporary sources really try to distance themselves um, from that and put uh, ideological and intellectual distance between the Crusaders proper and this kind of rabble as it's portrayed. It used to be called the Peasants' Crusade, uh, the people who carried out the Rhineland massacres. Thing is, many of the people in the Rhineland massacres, and this is something uh, modern historians have done by kind of joining the dots and working out who was where at what times, a lot of the people who took part in those massacres went on to join the main body of the Crusaders, and some of them did really well. So um, a particularly good example is Thomas of Marla. Uh, he was a, a lord in, in France, really horrible guy. He became known as Thomas the Most Accursed. He took part in those uh, anti-Semitic massacres. He was also one of the first people over the walls in 1099 when the crusade took Jerusalem. But reading these histories, you don't know that. And it's not because they're lying, although if they knew better, I think they would lie. It's because they are absorbing contemporary, essentially contemporary propaganda going, oh, these people aren't the proper crusaders. And so... It's misguided because they, they're not using critical thinking. But there's an earnestness to how they engage with these sources. Um, and I think I think that has to be acknowledged that they are making an effort, even if it's ideologically driven. The second thing I'd say is I don't think they're in it for the money. They're in it for the ideology. They're in it to defend the Crusades. I mean, they're both titled in such a way as to suggest that. Um, there, it's a lot of effort. I mean... Academic books are not known for their profitability uh, for the authors. So I don't think they are financial grifters. The thing is, both of these books are targeting an audience of typically um, right-wing American Catholics. Not exclusively. I think Rodney Stark is targeting a, a wider audience because he doesn't go in against the Catholics. Um, sorry, again, he doesn't, he doesn't go in against the Protestants, which means that you can sell it in a, a megachurch, um, and that's probably quite good for him. But they are, they are both targeting this kind of reactionary, religious, right-wing American demographic who chafe at the idea of things, who essentially chafe at the idea that Historically, things have not been great, morally speaking. Things like slavery, things like uh, you know Christopher Columbus, the Crusades. They don't like the idea that these were bad because they identify those things with their heritage. A lot of the traditional American Catholics view the Middle Ages as the glory days of their denomination, and so they feel a need to defend that. And so that, that's the demographic. That's the reason it's being written. I do not know the statistics on how much uh, money the respective authors made, but they're both prolific authors. And they both made a lot, uh, get a lot of influence within these circles. Um, Ryan Kopf in particular um, is very respected in traditionalist Catholic circles. And so it's they're being produced as a kind of way to generate not financial capital necessarily, but social capital within the movement. And so I don't think they're grifters, but they are. That doesn't make them honest. And I think they are being intellectually honest to serve both their own agenda. They're both 
both of their perceptions of an anti-Catholic agenda in modern historiography that isn't actually there, but also to serve as essentially ways to legitimize the pushback against moralizing pre-modern things is going, and maybe that's not so great. Situation that we see with this, with these kinds of ideologically driven groups, can you kind of explain a little bit more about this broader context? So we've got these authors who are writing for a ideological reason for a particular audience that is conservative, largely Catholic, but not exclusively. Um, Given that, like, kind of how do you see this broader literary world around them? Like, is this just kind of like a whole bunch of people all consuming the same media because of their political ideological bubble? Is this a particular political movement? Like, where does this fit into kind of broader society? So I'd say, firstly, it's not any particular movement. I mean, Rodney Stark wasn't even a Catholic. Um, so it's not, it's not that narrow. The thing is, um, and as anyone who's ever tried to find a decent video on the Crusades on YouTube has found, um, there are a lot of modern American conservative pundits who will talk about Crusade history and get all their talking points from these books. And so a kind of intellectual pipeline is you have these books that then inform a wider perception among particularly right-wing Americans about the Crusades and medieval history in general. And so, although in terms of academia, it might look like these books are in a little bubble because academics don't engage with them and they don't really engage with academics, they are actually quite relevant to public history because when legitimate historians go out into the world and share their history and they get this pushback of people going, oh, no, no, you're wrong, the Crusades were fine. I think a lot of modern historians don't, really get where that's coming from and they kind of write it off as as purely ideological reaction and okay that's true to an extent but that doesn't they still have to get the talking points from somewhere and those talking points you know it might be that if you have for example there's a crusade historian called thomas lecac who does a lot of public engagement and specializes in the first crusade he likes to get into arguments with people on Twitter about the Crusades, uh, not because he's trying to convince anyone, but because as he, as he puts it, you're not you're trying to convince the, the 500 people who are seeing the tweets, not the person you're arguing with. So that's why he does it. But it's interesting to note that if, when I look through his, his, kind of, his account and some of the people that he ends up arguing with, they get their talking points from some right-wing YouTuber, say, you know, Stephen Crowder, Ben Shapiro, that kind of, those kinds of people. And then they get their talking points from these books because these books to them look like legitimate history. As I said, you open up their bibliographies, they look good at a glance, they're decent history. Um, and then you want the, you know, the second you read the introduction, you realize, oh, this is garbage. But most people aren't going to look into it that far. And so there is this kind of public history pipeline where these books are very relevant but in the academic world, these books are reviewed exclusively, almost exclusively, by journals associated with Catholic think tanks. Um, they're not reviewed by academics at all. Um, and then that gives it the appearance of, oh, it's a harmless bubble. It's not. It feeds into a much broader ecosystem of right-wing reactionary ideas about medieval history that I think is very important because they're the people that actual crusade historians end up having to have arguments with and correcting their his, their bad history, not recognizing that it, it actually comes from books that their university probably has in their library. Um, and so there is a, a much broader environment in which these books are relevant. Broader ecosystem of this conservative Catholic view of the crusades why does it exist? Why is there such a focus on the Crusades, on the Middle Ages, amongst these conservative Catholic figures? Are they just trying to relitigate, you know, pre-Protestant Reformation ideas? Are they trying to justify the history of the Catholic Church? Uh, do they see themselves as in conflict still with 
you know, Protestant ideas. And it's kind of a tricky thing, as you mentioned, one of the authors is not particularly attached to Catholicism. Uh, but where does this specifically Catholic focus on the Middle Ages and let me, let me clarify, specifically conservative, radically traditional Catholic understanding of the Crusades in the Middle Ages come from? Why does it exist? I, I mean, it, it's, it's a very weird thing because these people are not writing books about William the Conqueror. Um, they don't care about that kind of medieval history. But it is, they, they are very fixated on the church as a kind of, as this being the, the, the um, peak of their authority. And I think it comes from the much more radical traditionalist Catholic ideas, because you get on the really extreme end, you get people who still regard uh, Protestants as heretics who should be fought. And you still get people who, I mean, you even get people, and you, you see it on Twitter when you see these traditionalist Catholics talking about Pope Francis, who essentially reject the post-Vatican II papacy as legitimate, who kind of see him almost as an anti-Pope. And so they are kind of stuck in this situation where the modern papacy, the one that has apologized for the Crusades, has to be seen as not a true reflection of Catholic thought. And so when they start looking back, they look back on where where the church was the most powerful, where to to combat the kind of declining influence of the Catholic Church in the modern world, where when was it most powerful? The answer to that is Innocent the Third. And Innocent the Third was quite famously the most keen on crusades. He he authorized a lot of them, so many that people kind of stopped turning up to some of them because it was cheapening, uh, as it were, the phenomenon. And I think it also comes back to a very popular idea in the Middle Ages called papal monarchy, where the popes, the popes of particularly the 12th century were trying to assert secular control over European kingdoms. You know, for a time, England was a papal vassal because it helped King John get out of Magna Carta. And so there's that political authority. If you drill into some of these really, really extreme traditionalist Catholics, they believe the church should rule the world. They are seeking political control. And so if you are a radical traditionalist Catholic who believes that the church should not only you know, be revitalized, but actually control public life, the 12th century papacy is the model. It is the success story in the future they want to create. Problem is, most people think the Crusades were kind of bad, including the papacy. So they feel, so they they absolutely fixate on the Crusades because it is the epicenter of the ideological and political struggle they think they are in, not only against Protestantism but against the world in general. Because the more extreme people who are the loudest promoters of these books and the people who will you know, gobble them up the second they are published. They want, they are not just, they are not just traditional, they are, I guess, dominionist. They, they want the revival of papal monarchy. And so to do that, they need to justify papal monarchy. And to do that, you need to justify one of the most powerful tools of papal monarchy in the 12th century, which was crusade. I was going to say, it's, it's rather ironic, though, because most of these radical, radical traditionalist Catholics probably aren't fans of the current papacy. And that kind of leads to a bit of an irony where you, would, you wouldn't expect the greatest support for a, you know, a temporally powerful papacy coming from people who don't like the modern papacy. And so that kind of gets to a broader question that I have. Many of these radical tra traditionalist organizations have kind of an uneasy relationship with the uh, church today. For example, many of these organizations are either set of anchist, meaning they don't recognize the current pope as the legitimate pope of the Catholic church. Some of them have been, if not necessarily excommunicated, have been marginalized by the church power structures that exist today. So is there, can you speak to this relationship between kind of the church today, which is very much tries to distance itself, has apologized for the Crusades, and I don't think anybody's accusing 
Francis of trying to wield the powers of temporal authority right now. Um, so what is this relationship like between the two? So, I mean, the relationship is, is very awkward because one of the big things about Vatican II is that the church effectively ceded its stance of supreme authority over all Christians. Like they kind of, that was the death knell of papal monarchy as an idea. And it's the point at which they stopped calling people heretics, essentially. Um, so the church can't go all in on condemning these groups because the point of Vatican II is that you need to work with your fellow Christians um, where the agenda is shared. And so there is this very uneasy relationship where they perhaps share conservative social values and will work together on that. But then you look at how they talk about each other in public and they do condemn each other. Some, um, many modern traditional Catholic Americans, American organizations are essentially schismatics. And the church kind of treats them as what I, I believe the technical term is separated brethren, where they are, they're still Catholics, they're still Christians, but they are separate from the church. And it, it is just, I'd say there is no codified policy. It's just an awkward situation where they will work with each other, where they share values and ignore each other when they don't. But the thing with these Tradcath groups is that they do, they, many of them do have this fantasy of taking over the papacy, which is obviously never going to happen, but they do, they do dream of a future where they're the ones deciding who the Pope is. And so there's this kind of laughable ambition to these traditionalist Catholic groups, whereas the papacy just kind of ignores them because it knows it can. So with the relationship between the actual church itself and these figures who see themselves as supporting a church that, to be frank, no longer exists and hasn't existed for centuries at the very least. If we're going to look at these modern understandings, I say modern, it's almost not worth calling them modern understandings of the Crusades. How do they relate not just to the broader literary ecosystem that they're in, not just to the actual structures of the church itself, but also to the modern historiography of the Crusades. How do modern historians of the Crusades figure into their approach or their understanding or their work? Um, because you mentioned that many of them do at least pretend to have read figures like Jonathan Riley Smith and other prominent Crusade historians, even if they don't engage with them critically within the text of their own books. So can you tell us a little bit more about that relationship? Okay, so the, the Jonathan Riley Smith thing in specific is fascinating to me because he was a devout Catholic. He was in the Knights Hospitaller, or one of its uh, continuations. Um, and he is deemed to be the most sympathetic modern historian who's legitimate um, toward the Crusaders. You know, he wrote an excellent article called Crusading as an Act of Love, Um which, you know, we don't associate crusades with loving action. But, you know, as a devout Catholic, he kind of understands the psychology of how you can reach the conclusion of being, of wanting to be a crusader out of love. And so he is on paper, you know, the guy you want to cite if you're a traditionalist Catholic writing a dodgy history of the crusades. I don't think, I mean, I, I, I'm not 100% certain because I don't have the books in front of me, but I don't think... Jonathan Riley Smith's article, Crusading as an Act of Love, is mentioned in either book, even though it's perfect for their purposes. And I think that comes back to their, their view of modern historiography as poisoned by Enlightenment thinkers, by secularism, because they view it as illegitimate in its moral and critical viewpoints, but they will still use it just for narrative. Um, Christopher Tyman, who is kind of, I wouldn't say he's necessarily the biggest name, but he's one of the big names. Like when he gives a paper, the room will be full. And his book, God's War, is a bestseller, and it's kind of the go-to book that I'd recommend if one wants to learn about the Crusades. He is very cynical about the church. 
um, even though he does kind of support a lot of what these authors are saying. Like he he argues that the uh, massacre at Acre in 1191 was Saladin's fault, not Richard's. And so you'd expect to see that kind of in these traditionalist Catholic perspectives on medieval history. Um, and it is in Glory of the Crusades, not in God's Battalions. Um, but it's it's very cherry-picked. And what's particularly interesting, especially in God's Battalions, is that he will... The, it will cite modern historians in a distinctly unacademic way. He will say, the distinguished John France, the revered Stephen Runciman. This is weird. Um, that's a really weird way to do it. Um, especially when you're quoting them out of context. If you did res genuinely respect John France's work, you, you'd actually you know, respect his work. And so there's this very strange situation where they have clearly read the modern books. They clearly understand the modern historiography. They clearly accept it as legitimate enough to cite in their books. But they don't consider it worth engaging with critically because in their and I think in their view that would be to overly legitimize the work of modern historians. God's Battalion is interesting because it tries to have its cake and eat it. In the start it goes, modern histories of the Crusades are rubbish, and will then describe modern Crusade historians as, you know, distinguished. And I I I frankly suspect the kind of person who's reading that book doesn't know enough about the Crusades anyway to pick up on that. But there's this this love hate relationship where they need these modern histories just for the basic facts of their book, because they're not going to trawl through every contemporary source and piece together everything. Why would they? Christopher Tymon already did it. But they they will only use the modern historiography insofar as it's useful for their um, their ideology, and that's that's perhaps why they write off Jonathan Riley Smith because although Jonathan Riley Smith is or was a devout man who sympathizes with the crusaders he shares the modern papal view that the crusades were not good and that makes him unsuitable he's been poisoned and so there, there is this odd wanting to have their cake and eat it relationship between these old books and the recent historiography because and the other interesting thing is because these books are trying to preserve a status quo well that didn't really exist but they're they're trying to preserve what they see as an older view that was legitimate and has been destroyed by the Protestants. They kind of have to be intellectually static. They can't acknowledge advances because that would suggest that the old view that they're defending was wrong. So they have to, on the one hand, out of practical necessity, they have to use modern histories. But they also have to, at the same time, say that historiographically, those modern histories are completely illegitimate. And it's it's this weird kind of double think in terms of the historiography and and that's the thing that kind of signals to me that these books are fundamentally dishonest because if they were being honest they wouldn't do that it's the hallmark of a book that has been written from the conclusion backwards and to me that is the the glaring issue is that it's, it's and the glaring problem with these books it's not just that they're bad it's that they are actively dishonest and the authors do know better because they have read Christopher Tynan. Okay, well, that kind of brings us full circle, you know, back around to this idea of working from their conclusions backwards and then trying to find ways to force the evidence to agree with their already arrived upon conclusion. Uh, did you have any concluding remarks that you wanted to leave us with? Um, or do you, I mean, are there any recommendations you have for actual good crusades historians that we could instead steer people towards? The final remark I would have on these books is that um, if you are interested in crusade history, I'm not saying don't outright re don't read them at all. It's a, they're very good examples of how to abuse history. If you want to know what a book written ideologically looks like, they are fantastic examples. So if you are, for example, a master's student or an undergraduate, and you're writing an essay on crusade historiography, they might be worth a look because they are interesting in, in that regard, in that you know, they're so bad that you can take lessons from them. In terms of 
what books people should read about the Crusades as a basis for learning about the Crusades initially. There's a wide variety. Um, anything by uh, Jonathan Phillips is good. Christopher Tymon's God's War is the kind of go-to. It's very long, and he has a rather esoteric writing style, but it's it's very well informed. People like um, Thomas Asbridge, Helen Nicholson, um, they're all good too. The main thing I, I'd say is, if you're unsure of what you're buying when you're looking for crusade history, or academic history in general, uh, look up the author and their academic affiliation. Because if they are affiliated with a religious organization, like Van Kopf is openly associated with traditionalist Catholic organizations, and uh, particularly a, a private university that takes money from them. And so check their academic background. If they, if they are from, say, the University of Nottingham, or Harvard, or, you know, an actual legitimate university, a secular university, they're probably fine. I do fine. want to actually push back on that just and for a second, if, because there are good Catholic historians and Catholic universities working on this stuff, just because, like, we do have universities like Fordham University, a Jesuit institution that does legitimate crusade history with people like Nicholas Paul. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's not a, a universal rule. Um, but I'd say as a place to start, um, it's worth checking. It's not it's not necessarily if they're from a if they are associated with a Catholic organization, don't buy it. I mean, you know, Jonathan Riley Smith would not pass that test. But just if that's all they've ever done, if all they've ever published is in Catholic journals, and that's the only kind of academic space they're in, they don't ac they don't there is no evidence of their interaction with a broader academic environment, take that as a red flag because people like Nicholas Paul do engage with broader academic environments. So look through the other books they've written, look through their, the articles they've written. If it's just traditionalist Catholic organizations, that is the demographic they are writing for, they are not interested in broader engagement. If they have an academic CV that is broad, that includes um, journals like Crusades, which is uh, the, the kind of main one, then that's good. You know, if they're engaging with a broader academic environment, that means that other academics, legitimate historians, have looked at their work and deemed it good. And so that's the main thing I'd suggest. If you, if you, I mean, start with someone like Jonathan Phillips, Christopher Tyerman, but if you're a bit unsure, look at their publications, look at the breadth of their publications, look at where they're being published, because that alone will tell you what they're about. And if they're just writing for Catholics, or if they are indeed part of a broader academic environment where their ideas are actually challenged. All right. And I think with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you for coming on the podcast. And I think we all uh, appreciate, you know, learning about this kind of this literary genre that not a lot of academics or historians really know exists. Yes. Thank you uh, for having me. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.